Hello everyone. Welcome to the section on recursion. This is part of the algorithms course created by the Stanford Crowd Course Initiative. All right, let's get started. What is recursion? Recursion in computer science is a method where the solution to a problem depends on solutions to smaller instances of the same problem. So essentially, we can break down a problem into smaller instances. This approach can be applied to many type of problems and recursion is one of the central ideas of computer science. So how do you have a function um a problem breaking itself up into smaller instances? We often use a function that calls itself directly or calls a function that in turn calls the original function. In this case, the original function is called the recursive function. So the power of recursion lies in the possibility of defining an infinite set of objects by a finite statement. So in the same manner an infinite number of computations can be described by a finite recursive program. If this is not clear now, this will become clearer in the upcoming slides. All right, let's look at an example of recursion. Supposing we wanted all alternate numbers starting from a certain given number up to the number 100. This is an example of a program that would compute the same. So void my function int number this is nothing but a function that takes in the number that you want which is less than 100. Now if your number is greater than 100 you return. So if the number you supplied in the first place is greater than 100 then you will not get anything. If the number supplied is less then you print the number and you call the function again on the number plus 2. Thus um, what you will get as an argument to the function will now be Uh, your original number plus two. Again, uh, if the number is greater than hundred, then you'll return. In which case, you have only printed the number that you first supplied. If it's not greater than hundred, then you print the current number and again add two and so on. So, when would this program eventually return? When the number crosses hundred. So this will illustrate a key property of recursive functions that recursive functions can go on infinitely like a loop to avoid infinite running of recursive functions there are two properties that a recursive function must have one is a base criteria which some people also called an escape hatch there must at least be one base criteria or condition such that when this condition is met the function stops calling itself recursively The other thing is that recursive call should progress in such a way that each time a recursive call is made it comes closer to the base criteria. You can kind of think of this like a loop. What happens if you don't increment or uh, decrement a variable such that eventually the base criteria is met? It's very easy for the loop to go to infinity. Similarly with recursion. So we will talk about how recursion is implemented. Many programming languages implement recursion by means of stacks. Generally whenever a function which is a caller calls another function we'll call this a callee or calls itself as callee the caller function transfers execution control to the callee this transfer process may also involve some data to be passed from caller to callee Okay now let's analyze recursion the time complexity of recursion if a call is made to a function is constant time and um If n is the number of times the recursive call is made it makes the recursive function big O of n and the space complexity of recursion is counted as the amount of extra space which is required for a module to execute the space complexity of the recursive function may be much higher than that of an iterative function so one may argue why make a recursive function when the same task can be done with iteration The first reason is recursion makes a program more readable and because of today's enhanced CPU systems recursion is much more difficult than iterations time complexity in case of iterations we take the number of iterations to count the time complexity likewise in the case of recursion assuming everything is constant we try to figure out the number of times recursive calls are being made a call made to a function is constant times hence if a recursive call is made n times this makes a recursive function o of n All right now we're going to discuss a very interesting puzzle which is often solved using recursion so this puzzle is known as the tower of hanoi and um the basic construct is that you have three pegs we'll call one of these pegs the source peg one of these pegs the destination peg and one of these pegs is the auxiliary peg now you have three disks um the lower one is the largest the second one is medium and the top one is the smallest this puzzle can easily be extended to um any number of disks 
In fact, there is a very popular story involving monks moving thousands of these discs to solve the uh, Tower of Hanoi puzzle. But for now, um, to, for illustrative purposes, we will just use these three discs. So, um, we see that these rings uh, are stacked upon each other in ascending order. And um, we're going, our aim is to transfer all these discs from the source peg to the destination peg following certain rules. The rules are, only one disc can be moved amongst the towers at any given time. Only the top disc can be removed. And most importantly, no large disc can sit over a smaller disc. The mission is to move all the discs to some other tower without violating the sequence of arrangement. Alright, so let's look at a solution of how we could possibly move these discs to under tower. So, in the first step, we move the smaller disc to what will become a destination tower. Then, uh, in the second step, we move the middle disc to um, the auxiliary tower. In the third step, we move the smaller disc on top of the middle disc. In the fourth step, we move the largest disc to uh, the destination tower. In the fifth step, we move back the small disc to the source star. In the sixth step, we move the middle disc onto um, the destination tower. And finally, we move back the smallest disc onto the destination tower. We'll see now that um, all the discs have been transferred from the source star to the destination tower. The Tower of Hanoi puzzle with n discs can be solved in a minimum of 2 power n minus 1 steps. So we just saw in this case that if you um, substitute n as 3 since there are 3 discs, this can be solved in 2 power 3 minus 1 equal to 7 steps. To write an algorithm for Tower of Hanoi, first we need to learn how to solve this problem with a lesser amount of discs. Say if we only had 1 or 2 discs. We mark three tasks with names, source, destination and auxiliary. Auxiliary uh, tasks are only used to help moving discs. If we have only one disc, then it can easily be moved from source to destination peg. So we will consider the case of having two discs. If we have two discs, we first move the smaller one to the auxiliary peg. We move the larger one to the destination peg. We move back the smaller one from the auxiliary to the destination peg. And thus we have moved the disc from the source peg to the destination peg. So essentially these are the steps you have to follow. Now if we think back to the final result. So if you have n discs which have to be moved to a destination peg, you can essentially move n minus 1 disc from the source to the auxiliary peg. You can move the nth disc. The nth disc in this case is the largest disc at the bottom. So you can move the n disc from the source to the destination peg. And then you can again move n minus 1 disc from the auxiliary peg to the destination peg. Alright, so now we will look at how to code this up. So we would just write um, whatever your function Hanoi which gets us input the disc, the source, destination, auxiliary peg. So if disc equal to 0 if you have no disc then you just um, move the disk from the source to the destination. This is also works for if you know disk is equal to 1. If you have only one disk, you move the disk from source to destination. But um, we can only write if disk equal to 0 because anyway that will be the escape hatch. Okay. So in the else part of the program, you have uh, Hanoi disk minus 1 source auxiliary disk. So this is essentially the step 1 which we had seen before which is moving n minus 1 disk from the source to the auxiliary peg. Then you move disk from source to disk. This is nothing but moving the largest disk from the source to the destination peg. Then you move back the uh, n minus 1 disk from the auxiliary peg to the destination peg. So this is nothing but step 3 which is move n minus 1 disk from the auxiliary peg to the destination peg. In this way, you have solved Tower of Hanoi. Now, each of these recursive calls will in turn call the function again, but this time with n minus 1 disk. Okay, so now we have seen the Tower of Hanoi puzzle. We look at another very interesting problem that comes up often in computer science, which is the Fibonacci series. The Fibonacci series generates subsequent numbers by adding the two previous numbers. It starts from two numbers, F0 and F1. We initialize this to either 0 and 1 or 1 and 1 respectively. Fibonacci series satisfies the following conditions. 
that any number fn is made up of fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2 which means that it's just the sum of the previous two numbers. So a Fibonacci series can look like this. It could be 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. This is if you initialize f0 to 0 and f1 to 1 or it could be 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 if you initialize f0 to 1 and f1 to 1. Alright, so could you think um, how we would code this iteratively? So if we had to just code this iteratively, so, um, supposing we want to write a program to compute the nth Fibonacci number, right? So we would just go uh, iterate 1 to n, initializing f0, f1, and we would compute each Fibonacci number as the sum of the previous two, which is what this algorithm does. So now, can you think how we would write this program if we wanted to be recursive, if we wanted to be in a function that calls itself, which essentially means a function that um, utilizes instances of smaller problems? So we know that the Fibonacci number uh, n is nothing but the Fibonacci number of um, n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci number of n minus 2, which is the n minus 1th Fibonacci number and the n minus 2 Fibonacci number. So we have a base condition that if n is less than or equal to 2, return 1. And um, so this essentially means that we are initializing f of 0 to 1 and f of 1 to 1. And if it's a larger number, we return the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of n minus 2. Because every term is the sum of the previous two terms. Okay, now we will look at the factorial function. We indicate the factorial of any number n by n factorial. Now n factorial is essentially 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 all the way up to n minus 1 into n. Let's look at how to uh, compute this factorial function. So um, we've just seen that it's the multiplication of um, every number, uh, every natural number up to n. So the factorial function is defined for all positive integers along with 0. Can you think of what value should 0 factorial have? It's a product of all integers greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 0, but there are no such integers. Therefore, we define 0 factorial to equal the identity for multiplication, which is 1. One more interesting way to think about factorials are that um, they are the number of permutations of n objects. So if you have n, um, n objects, you can rearrange them in n factorial ways. So this makes sense again why 0 factorial would be 1. Because if you had 0 objects, there's only one way you could arrange them, which is nothing. So that's often a way about um, why it might seem counterintuitive that 0 factorial is defined as 1, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So now we have a way to think about n factorial. It equals 1 when n equal to 0, and it equals um, 1, 2, into 3, into 4, into 5, dot, dot, uh, so on and so forth, to n minus 1 to n when n is positive. All right. Now let's think about the recursive algorithm to compute n factorial. So can you think of how to divide this algorithm such that um, it utilizes previously computed instances? Okay, we can compute the factorial function on n by first computing the factorial function on n minus 1 because n factorial is nothing but n minus 1 factorial into n. Thus, computing n minus 1 factorial is a subproblem that we solve to compute n factorial this leads us to a very elegant program to compute a factorial recursively. So you can see that um, this function just accepts n. If n equal to equal to 0, return 1 because we know that uh, 0 factorial is 1. Else we return n into factorial of n minus 1. The factorial of n minus 1 is a recursive call and it needs to be multiplied by n to give us a result of what n factorial is. Now some small tips for you when you're writing recursive procedures yourself. Always identify the escape hatch and the associated result first. And make sure the recursive call is for a smaller problem. That is somehow you are made solving the problem easier by making a recursive call. So thank you. Here are some more references that you can use to learn more about recursion. I hope you had a great session.